All right, so we talked a little bit about um, W.E.B. Du Bois earlier in the previous lecture. And uh, so this is a uh, just a portrait of uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, or a photo. Now, another uh, group that came around uh, during the uh, progressive movement were uh, the socialists. And uh, socialism uh, gets, uh, you know, what exactly is uh, socialism? Uh, well, this is when the state, and when we say state, I don't mean like Louisiana, Texas, I uh, basically mean the, the government. Um, a state is actually a synonym for nation. Uh, we don't think of it in that way, but if you think about uh, France, in the state of France or, you know, the Netherlands, these are states, uh, China. Uh, and so, you know, the founding fathers uh, in the Constitution, I mean, they, um, it was a, you know, it was very important to maintain uh, the sovereignty of the states. Now, how much so uh, has been a matter of debate ever since, and it's still uh, a matter of debate. And in fact, uh, uh, presidential candidates like uh, Ron Paul uh, believe very strongly in state rights. Okay, and uh, he's run for president several times. Now, uh, the socialist socialism or the socialists, what they believed. I mean, there were different types of socialists. Um, it is not exact. You know, it's not what some people think it is. It's, it's not a redistribution of the wealth, although that is um, a result of um, their ideas. So basically what they say is that the government, you know, owns the means of production. In other words, uh, as an individual, you're not going to own a railroad or own a business. The, the government is going to own this. Now, a result of that is that you may, you may actually have more equal, at least according to socialists, more equality of outcome. Okay, now this is very different uh, than um, what Theodore Roosevelt advocated, uh, which was a equality, which was equality of opportunity. So. You know, that's, like I said, that's different than socialism that believed in the equality of outcome. And the way you get that, of course, is uh, the government ownership of business. Let's just... So... Who is this guy? Well, a leader in the socialist movement in the early 1900s, which was part of the progressive movement. It didn't um, necessarily, you know, there weren't like a majority of progressives were uh, definitely not socialist. So I don't want you to equate progressivism at that time of the progressive movement with socialism, but just part of a little branch of the progressive movement was or uh, one uh, part of uh, the progressive movement was led by socialists like uh, this guy. His name was Eugene V. Debs. And what Eugene V. Debs uh, believed, um, and again, they never was they were never a major threat to uh, the Republicans or the Democrats, uh, but he believed in or advocated a gradual, peaceful, and democratic shift from capitalism to socialism. So he, he wasn't a revolutionary in that, oh, well, you know, the working class needs to take over uh, the uh, means of production, all right, and take over the capitalist or anything like that, okay? And um, one of the things that I, I thought was really interesting uh, and one of the reasons I talk about uh Eugene V. Debs uh, because he would uh, run, you know, for several times he ran uh, for political office. 
And he said, I'd rather vote for something I want and not get it than for something I don't want and get it. And, uh, you know, some people that vote for third parties uh, will say that. Now, for example, uh, Ron Paul, um, a lot of people, you know, he's definitely not a socialist. He's on the other end of the political spectrum. Uh, but uh, people say, well, he has no, no uh, chance. But they could, you know, say kind of what Deb said. All right, so I'd rather vote for something I want and not get it than for something I don't want and get it. So, um, you know, I've always found that interesting uh, about Debs. Now, one of the things that we have to look at when we talk about the progressive movement are the muckrakers. And the muckrakers, you need to know this, were journalists who would sort of rake up uh, the muck in society, and they would look at um, things, the injustices in society, and they would expose uh, these injustices. Uh, you had um, uh, people like uh, Lincoln uh, Steffens, probably pronounce it Stevens as well. You hear that probably more, but it just always looked like Stephens to me. Uh, and he wrote uh, The Shame of Well, I should The Shame of the Cities. Actually, I should underline it because it was that means that should be out of there. Uh, in 1904, this was really a compilation, I believe, of several articles that he wrote that um, really um, talked about the rampant uh, corruption in city governments. Okay. Um, there were others, and probably um, um, one of the more famous ones was how the other half lives uh, this was written by a guy of um, Danish uh, descent and this is early on 1890 a guy by the name of Jacob uh, Rees I believe his name was let me see I have it in my notes yes and uh, he just talked about this you know the, the, the inequality that was going on in uh, the cities inequality in, in the cities. Economic inequality. That's not a very good... And probably one of the most famous um, muckrakers was Upton Sinclair. Now remember, these were, were journalists, these were writers that uh, wrote and exposed uh, what they felt were the injustices uh, in American society. And um, he wrote The Jungle. Now what The Jungle was originally about uh, was, was the poor working conditions of immigrants in Chicago, in the meatpacking I don't know if you've ever heard of Chicago called uh, be called uh, Packing Town, um, but um, there were a lot of uh, immigrants from Eastern Europe. Uh, you basically had two immigrant groups. Uh, one came from Northwestern Europe. And these uh, came really like in the 1850s, uh, 60s, all right? But starting in the mid-1870s, you started getting a different group of immigrants coming in um, from Eastern Europe. And because they came from Eastern Europe, uh, many of them were uh, Jewish, um, they were Eastern Orthodox, 
Um, many of them came from Southern Europe. Uh, so they were also, many of them were Catholic. And so because of this, because of um, oftentimes being of darker skin, of being Jewish or Eastern Orthodox, of really having a culture that was very different, um, and because they, they, they moved to the cities, uh, they were much more conspicuous, and so there was a backlash to these, these immigrants. But nonetheless, one of, let's get back to the muckrakers uh, and the jungle. And so what Upton Sinclair wanted to do was to show uh, the poor working conditions that immigrants had to, uh, that, were conf ha that immigrants were confronted with. But really what he showed uh, was the, um, uh, the poor sanitation of uh, the meatpacking uh, industry. Okay, in fact, um, it inspired during the, the, the during uh, Roosevelt's administration uh, the meat inspection act, 1906. Uh, this was during the, the Roosevelt administration. Roosevelt uh, is the one that introduced it to Congress because he read uh, The Jungle and he even said he had to go um, regurgitate in his, the White House bathroom after reading certain sections of it. Uh, well, as Sinclair put it, uh, he had aimed for the nation's heart uh, but had hit its stomach. And Sinclair in the jungle told of the sale of meat stacked on the filthy packing house floor of the sale of pregnant or diseased cows, of packers with boils on their hands, of rancid butter whose odor was hidden by chemicals, of horse and goat meat uh, disguised as beef. Actually, go goat meat's not too bad. Uh, and I did eat horse once, so uh, you know, it wasn't that really that good. You know, it's not like I sit around sometimes and think, oh man, I got the own V for some horse. You know, it really wasn't that big of a deal uh, as when I was in, um, in Europe. One time they had, a, you could buy a horse in Belgium and, and eat it. Uh, but, you know, when you want to eat a steak, you really don't want it to be horse or a goat for that matter. Um, the sale of moldy, and, uh, of moldy meat rejected in Europe. Uh, the sale of beef covered in rat droppings. That's disgusting. Moisture dripping from the ceilings. Uh, the transportation of meat in rusted old barrels of workers washing their hands in, in water, which was then used to make sausage. That's disgusting, all right? Uh, and worst of all, a few occasions when poisoned rats died and just fell into the uh, vats uh, and made into, uh, you know, that was um, processing sausage or whatever. It was basically sold uh, as uh, beef. Um, there was a, a one occasion when a worker even fell into the vats and was sold as beef. That's disgusting. All right, Many readers were so sickened that they could not even eat meat for a long time. This is probably the first time, this is probably the, uh, you know, when you start seeing more vegetarians uh, in the United States. I mean, the United States are not, you know, Americans are not known uh, for their best eating habits and are certainly not known, uh, there's not many vegetarians. There are certainly not a lot of vegetarians in uh, South Louisiana. There was a popular little song at the time that went like this. Uh, Mary had a little lamb and when she saw it sicken, she shipped it off to Packingtown and now it's labeled chicken. And so in 1906, and again, this is part of the progressive movement they passed the Meat Inspection Act. And we're almost finished. We've got one more little short lecture for you, and then we'll talk about your test.